Hello, and welcome to our virtual annual discipline meeting for the 2023-2024 year. For those who may not know me, I'm Dane Lamont, the School Partnership Specialist for Penn Highlands Dual Enrollment Program. During our fall 2023 semester, we resumed our in-person ACE discipline meetings at the Penn Highlands Richland campus. There, our college liaisons were able to hold live sessions with our ACE instructors to discuss specific topics related to the disciplines that you teach. While we understand that it is not always possible for teachers to attend the live meetings, these discussions were recorded so those absent can gain the benefit of the event. Please enjoy the recording of your annual discipline specific activity. And we look forward to working with you in the fall and hope you can join us in the next ACE discipline meeting. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, we have a small group here, so we can just get going here with this. And I probably won't even take up the full hour of your time here tonight. But as it says here on this thing, um, welcome. This is our ACE liaison meeting here today. I, I first of all want to thank you all for doing what you do, um, especially as somebody who's can still working on my doctorate and it is in a massive amount of debt um, what you're doing to help these students is incredible right to be able to give them that accelerated jump on that and so they won't have to have as much debt when they go out on into college and already have some of these classes done i think is an immense wonderful service you're giving to these students so i want to thank everybody for doing that first and foremost here um, i really wish i'd have had this opportunity whenever i was 16 17 years old it would have probably changed my life in some ways so i really think what you're doing is monumental in that way and so today I want to talk a little bit about AI. Um, comp in the 21st century is what I'm sort of calling this. And because we went ahead and made an overhaul of our composition curriculum here at Penn Highlands over the past summer, uh, my colleague Lance Hershberger and I worked together to completely rewrite, well, not completely rewrite, but readjust the composition syllabus to sort of reframe it and give it more of a 21st century outlook. Because I feel like it was written sort of antiquatedly before. It, it, was, it was stuck in the past and we needed to bring it into the future. So ultimately, right, our agenda today, introduction, we're getting that done. I want to go over some primary goals with you, discuss AI in a, in a couple of different ways here, and I want to hear from some of you and some, maybe some of the experience you've been having with it, which we already just started that discussion earlier, but we can continue it now. Look at that new Comp 1 syllabus, look at the new Comp textbook, which I have copies here that we can even pass around and look at at this point. Uh, talk about the common assessment information which is required. We have to go over that information. That's the boring stuff, but we have to go over it. And then go over and open up any questions for you all at that point. So ultimately, I think right now, our college classrooms are amid a shape, like it says here, right? How we present information, how people write and interact with the written word, and a shakeup in how we approach the discipline that's constantly under attack by the very humanity we study in a lot of ways. I think we're at a point in this discipline with the introduction of chat GPT and these other AI softwares that this is a turning point and a time that I think we need to put our foot feet down as, as teachers of this discipline and say what we do matters. What we do really matters, especially in a world where information literacy and all of those things are falling falling to the in the waste bin for the most part. Um, so I'd say here, there's no, I don't have an easy quick fix for you today. I wish I did. I wish I was like, this is going to be the way that we need to shift the discipline and get through this hard time. But I do hope that this just at least gets us thinking, right, and ways that we can continue to push this discipline forward, adapt, and evolve over the that are at our doorstep right now. So again, our primary goals today, right, discuss artificial intelligence and its role in the English classroom. Um, look at this new Penn Highlands comp syllabus and text. I want to refresh our awareness about the role of assessment a little bit too. I know as high school educators, you're probably more ingrained in this than I am a lot of the time. I know you have a lot more assessment standards that you have to meet than I do at the college level, but I want to refresh our awareness about that and go over some of the standards that we're implementing here at, at Highlands moving forward, and then obviously answer any questions that you all may have about this here today. So AI, right? The big sort of elephant in the room when it comes to writing classrooms. Right, and so I don't know if anybody ever used AIM or ICQ. I'm still, I'm only 35, so I'm still a millennial, and I'm fairly, I, I had experience with these things. And I used AIM, ICQ, but maybe we've had experience with this in customer service scenarios, right, chat bots, where things that you give them in it, you give them a prompt and they'll respond back to you. Right, that's essentially all chat GPT and the other similar softwares are, but they're more than your average chat bot. Right, they're known as LLMs, right? this idea of a large language model. So essentially, they feed them everything that's on the internet at a certain period of time, 
let it learn it, and then it produce predictive text based on algorithms that tell it which words are more likely to come next. Right? Like we were talking about the table there, I really hate calling it a writing tool, because it's not, it doesn't write. Because if we really think about what writing is, writing is thinking, right? Writing is a representation of your thoughts on the page. ChatGPT doesn't do that. ChatGPT just predicts words that are gonna be most likely to come after the first word. So you take the word the, what's most likely to come after the? It's gonna use algorithms and math to figure that out. Which, as an English person who always failed my math classes, I tend to take offense to that in some ways, in, in, in one way or another here. But it's not a writing tool, right? It's a sentence creation tool is really the way I like to frame it and look at it. And the way I sell it to my students too is the way I talk to about with my students is that this doesn't write for you because writing is more than producing text. Writing is thinking, writing is critical thought, writing is trying to be aware of how you're communicating and your audience and the rhetorical situation, which we'll talk about here in a little bit with our update to the comp one syllabus. So I really try to get that across to them in my students whenever I talk to them about this, is that this is simply a sentence creation tool. I know there's a lot on this slide here, and this detent thing is in the way, but, oh, let me go back. but the problem, what's the worry, right? The old adage, teaching how to fish versus learning, or versus giving them a fish, right? ChatGPT gives them the fish, and it can become a crutch. <laughs> ultimately, is the problem that I think is the biggest one that we see. Can we all agree? I'm hearing some nods, and, right? It can become a crutch. And at, at a certain point then, yeah, they might do just fine in comp one with essays that are written like that, and they might be able to pass and get through. But then when they get, as I think you were saying earlier, when they get to a 200, 300 level class, a professor's going to look at that essay and go, this is not good, right? This is, this is rote, this is formulaic, this is not good writing at this point. So I think we need to show them that, right? And I think exposing students to AI and showing them its limitations is a key step in this process, right? Further, it has inherent biases, right? It's written by humans, and humans are flawed, right? And we all have inherent biases within us in some way. So I think even discussing it in, through that manner with your students and showing them that even, even this, 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 piece, this piece of technology has biases inherent within it is something important to show them and discuss with them in that moment. Right, there's been, um, I listened to a New York Times podcast the other day that was discussing this idea of how they will get into, they will start hallucinating too. Where if you feed them too many prompts and you can continue to ask it to regenerate, it might just start hallucinating completely imaginative things. Mm -hmm. and Just start telling you falsehoods. Like, there was a reporter for the New York Times who it told him his wife was cheating on him. It, it kept telling him this and it kept telling him, you need to break up with your wife, your wife's cheating on you. Because he was prompting it with these prompts that were asking it to sort of act like, uh, what's that movie where the AI comes to life and falls in love with the guy? Her. her. It was, it was, he was prompting it to act like her, so it acted like her. Right? Because obviously it's probably read the whole script of her at some point. It was probably fed that at one point or another. So it started to act like it was in love with this New York Times reporter. It's not sentient. Right? But it had read her. Right? It had read things that it made it think, oh, this is what the person giving me prompts wants. The person wants me to act as if I'm sentient here. So it started hallucinating these things for him. Another problem, right? verifying information and misinformation at this point. I trust you all to be able to do this as professional English instructors in your fields. You're good at this. 16, 17 year old, 19 year old students, not so much, right? They won't be able to look at that and recognize what's misinformation and what's not. Right? And I think that's a, one of the biggest worries that I have with it personally. I, I'm less worried about the sentence creation stuff. I'm more so worried about it's giving information that people aren't fact checking. People aren't looking to see if it's actually right or not, which then can snowball as we've seen in many different ways throughout our current world that we live in. The loss of individual voice. Right, is another major worry here. If we, we're going to play around with ChatGPT here in a second, I'm going to bring it up and we'll just poke, give it a couple prompts to see what it does. And I'm sure those of you that have played around with it already, notice it does not have an individual voice. It is cliche after cliche after cliche after very formulaic sentence structure or other formulaic sentence structure. It doesn't have a personality, which thank God it doesn't have one. Right? I think in some ways I'm very grateful that it does produce such poor writing in that way. And then human communication is relational. Right? This rhetorical situation that we have in the English writing classroom and within all forms of communication doesn't exist when you're communicating one way with a computer in that manner. It just gives you what it thinks you want in those moments. It doesn't actually consider the context there. And then more globally, right? 
I'm concerned a little bit about this. The massive amount of, of storage it takes to store these soft these servers and the energy it takes to to do this type of AI work is also a concern more sort of broadly and more globally. So I've been doing this is what I've been struggling with for pretty much since this was released, right? Since this came to be a thing. How do I either combat or embrace it? What are the ways that I can utilize this in my classroom? And so I attended a webinar um, done by Norton, who is our textbook producer for this, where they talked about, they brought in some experts from, there was one from the University of Pittsburgh, there was one from the <laughs> University of Maryland, who came in and were talking about ways that we can deal with this. So I think, they were discussing this idea of authentic assessment, which I thought was really an interesting idea here, to discuss how do I create assignments that students actually want to do, right? that they actually feel like I might actually gain something by, by actually writing this myself. Right? Ooh, lost my track here. Right? This idea of students want to do the work, instructors want to do the grading, and generative AI cannot grasp the assignment you're giving them in some way. To get to that point, they suggested integrating unique course experiences. Right. Instead of just saying, summarize Faulkner's Rose for Emily for me, why don't you say, how would, um, based on our discussion, how do you think Mr. Mr. Stumpf would respond to Rose for Emily? Now let's write an essay as if you were Mr. Stumpf responding to a Rose for Emily from his perspective. ChatGPT has no idea what I think, but my students do based on our conversation in the classroom. So they can interpret, bring in that unique course experience to be able to then interpret that text without having the opportunity to even go to ChatGPT. Because they're going to go to ChatGPT and be like, what does Mr. Stump think of a rose for Emily? And it's going to go, I, I mean, it's going to give them something, but it's not going to be what my actual thoughts would be about that. Right, so incorporating unique course experiences into the lessons is something that has been coming up through a lot of the reading and research I've done on this that I think is a really effective way to combat this, right? or at least eliminate the opportunity for them to even use it in that way. Um, personal reflections. It, I don't know how many of you already incorporate those into your writing classrooms. I know I've more so incorporated them now uh, than I ever did in the past, where after a major essay is submitted, the next class day, we're writing reflections. That's what we're doing. And then I'm looking at them now, really detailedly, in comparison to their essay to see, did they write this, right? Are they actually reflecting on what's actually on the page? Can they tell me, one of the reflective questions too is like, if you were to take this one step further, where would you go with it? Right, so then it shows me they actually understood what was on the paper that they submitted to me in that way. So offering them those sort of those places to do those reflections. Um, there's many suggestions on replacing summaries as assignments because ChatGPT can do that. That's something it can replicate very easily. Again, if you tell it, summarize the, the plot of A Rose for Emily, it's going to do a really good job of doing that. And it's going to give you exactly what you're looking for, much better than your student <coughs> probably even could in that way. So getting rid of those types of assignments is one way to also work towards this. And then also this focus on process, right? And this is something we were also talking about at the table there a little bit, is like what writing really is. Right? I feel like so many of my students come into the college classroom thinking that writing is just fingers on keyboard. That's all they think the process is. They think producing text, they essentially feel like they are chat GPT at that moment. They just have to produce text. And I really have been focusing more on the process with my students, really trying to break things down for them, put less focus on the product, grade the outlines, make, have those be part of the final grade for the product, less focus on the actual final essay, more focus on those steps that lead up to it. Like assign point value to the outlines, assign point values to know, annotated bibliographies, assign point values to those sort of things instead which you may already do, but even focusing more on that is a way to get away from this as well. Right? The essay is just the assessment tool to show us they did the thinking. We want to see the thinking that comes before it is really what we're searching for as English instructors, at least in my opinion. Um, as we were talking about at the table too, this idea of requiring sources and reviewing them. Um, it can generate source materials, and I'm interested to hear about your experiences with this as well and, how, and what you've seen it do. ChatGPT4 is 20 bucks a month, and it's terrifying. If anybody's ever played that, played with it. I got a one, one month subscription with it just to see what it can do, and it can actually cite in, in proper MLA format. Um, terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Because um, it is actually connected to the internet. So the paid version will actually go out and search new things that are currently being produced. Whereas GPT-3, and now it's 3.5 they're up to, um, it is fed information and then it has a database that it uses to generate things. Whereas GPT-4 is actually a searchable 
it's, it goes on the internet on its own. How old that database is, how often it gets updated. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to know that too. I, when we first, we did a presentation here on campus at the opening week of this semester, uh, me and the, the one librarian and my English department colleague. And at that time it had over, it was like some, somewhere around like 60 some terabytes of data is what, the, what, it, what it had at that, so, that point. And that's, that number is ever growing as they continue to feed it more and more. Um, and as a non-computer person, that, that doesn't really make that much sense to me. I know it's a lot. That's a lot. I just know that's a lot. I don't, know, I don't have an actual grasp on how much information that really is, but I know it's a lot of information is what they've been able to feed it in that way, right? Um, talk with students about this, right? I've been finding, and I think you were saying this too earlier, this idea, some students actually get it. Like they look at it and they go, this is cheating. No, get this away from me. And you go, oh my God, I love you. Like thank you for seeing that and getting it, right? And talking with them about it. Like helping them recognize what writing actually is. Like we were saying there, that it is actually thinking, it is actually process, it isn't just product. And then discuss the potential, there's potential benefits here too, right? Equitably. Equi uh, equitability here. It can level the playing field for some students. Um, especially at the college level, whenever they get here, I, I see a very, I see a wide spectrum of students that enter my classrooms here from all walks of life, from all different areas, and allowing them to use it in st different parts of the process can help level that playing field. Because some of them really know, some of them already know it's process, and they start with an outline, and they start working towards it. And I go, you had an awesome high school English teacher. Some of them don't. And I, I use this as a tool to help them at level that playing field with them. All right, you don't know how to work through this process. Let's use, we can use ChatGPT to help you generate an outline. And now you see what an outline looks like. Now you know how to do one on your own, hopefully, is the end goal there. So we can also have some potential benefits in that way. Um, so one way, to, one approach is to outright ban it, right? You can just tell students, nope, not allowed to use it. But I mean, I already see some heads nodding, but that's it's not. It's like anything you tell teenagers they can't uh -huh. do. Yes. <laughs> like it says here, right, I, am, I was always a fan, and one of my professors in grad school always said, always historicize was one of his favorite comments. And so I say here, remember, the printing press, right? Everyone hated Gutenberg, thought he was ruining, the, ruining humanity. It didn't. It didn't ruin humanity, right? People thought the calculator was going to ruin mathematics. No one would ever have to do math again. Guess what? We still have a math department here on campus. Right? And the computer and the internet, I, I remember those, I was still a student whenever those were still coming about, and my, student, my teachers were freaking out about how much it was changing the dynamic. The internet, they were right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you on that. Right? And so there's different approaches to doing this here, and so I found a few resources I just wanted to share with you here. Um, this is one that I, and I will be able to share this with you all, this entire presentation and everything. Um, this is from the University of Pittsburgh's Writing Institute, where they brought up a number of different ways that you can prepare your class, encourage ethical use of AI, right? talk about the actual goals of assignments, design assignments with clear learning goals orienting around the processes rather than the products. These are some of the things I was already saying to you. It's, it's reiterating a lot of this. Stage assignments through smaller, low-stakes formative exercises. Um, remember that you are responsible for your writing. Right? You cannot give the AI your authority and having AI do the writing will not absol absolve you of your responsibility to learn the material from this class, right? And so there's a number of different things they have in this here that you can have access to and I will put this up that you can look at. But I thought this was a nice resource that was produced by the University of Pittsburgh that offers some concrete ways to discuss this with your students. Mm -hmm. And then this one I don't know how many of you are podcast listeners, but if you if you have to drive the whole way back to Kerwinsville, you can listen to at least one of these on your way back here. I already have my <laughs> so I, I've, this series here on how to think about AI was one that I think really changed my perspective on this a lot. Um, this is by Freakonomics. Um, I, I've always loved Jason Dubner and his work through this, but regardless of your interest in any economics in any way, this really deals with just AI. And this the one that really changed my mind is this last one, AI is changing everything, does that include you? And he gives us a positive outlook on this, wherein they discuss the idea that AI and ChatGPT and the other similar softwares are only as good as the prompt it gets. So they're saying in a, in a either utopic or dystopic future, depending on your outlook, people will have the job of prompt writers. That can be an actual job title that people will have where you'll be just, if you're a good writer, you're gonna write prompts for AI so then it can produce things. Because good writers 
you need good prompts to get good outputs, right? And so good writers still have to exist, right? So people still need to know how to write, even, even in the most dystopic future, people that in our classrooms, if they do well, they'll end up being prompt writers in some way, right? But they will still have jobs. There will still be things to do with writing in the future, no matter what, even in the worst case scenario. So I found that to be, um, I don't know, necessarily inspiring, but at least um, brought me back from the edge of the cliff whenever I heard that in that moment, right? Okay. Okay, even in the worst case scenario, writing will still matter. But I hope we never even get to that worst case scenario. I just read this chapter today with my students in 1984. Winston Smith still has a job and it's as a writer. Yep. In the dystopian <laughs> world. So even in, even in 1984, he keeps his job as a writer, right? And even if we're head barreling towards that, we will still keep our jobs, hopefully. Um, so again, I wanted to ask you a little bit about this, right? In what ways have you seen AI already in your classrooms? Have you worked to combat, embrace it at all? And then what are your thoughts? Do you really lean more dystopic or utopic at this point? Comment? Yeah, I, I lean more, I, I'm not dystopic or utopic. I'm, I'm probably in the middle. I, okay. I think all, all new technologies have corresponding good and bad. It's just how we're using them. Um, so I am not somebody who combats new stuff. You know, I just want to understand it and have the kids understand it. I mean, as a you know Gen Xer who was born in 1971, you know, I've been there for the entire video games and the whole way through it. So yeah, from the very beginning of, of that. So um, every time somebody said it was going to be the end of humanity, it, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, I uh, we talked before up there about how I've used it just to show my students a little bit about it. I actually had one of our drama teacher at the school, um, he has the kids come up with scenarios for little one act plays and feed them into chat GPT and then has it write the, a one act play for them. And then they take that script that it's given them, tweak it, and then they act it. Yeah, it's a lot quicker yeah. way to, because he's more concerned with the drama, like getting up there and actually performing mm -hmm. in this class than actually writing drama so but it's a way for them to be creative do a little bit of writing but then get to the process quicker so they can actually get to what he wants to do which is act I like that bringing up the actual learning objectives there makes a lot of sense the learning objectives are to the acting not the writing so mm -hmm. use it to get to the actual objective there like and make it a quicker <clears throat> jump to the objective I like that and that could be an interesting way too to you know put something into it <clears throat> I mean I haven't done it but then talk to students about how could you make it better like mm -hmm. you know, this is very basic now what would we do to tweak this to actually make it a more yeah. relevant like almost peer review the ai yeah yeah mm -hmm. <clears throat> look at the ai and give it some crit critiques and some comments i think that's a really good way to it's honestly if, if you think about it too like these are not activities that necessarily are even ones that haven't been done for the last 30 or 40 years in english classrooms like if you have a creative writing type of class where you might give the students like terrible drafts of something and say, okay, can we fix this? Can we make this better? I mean, but you had to pay, you had to pay a company to do all that for you with a textbook. Mm -hmm. This is way cheaper and it's a way to do the exact same thing, leveling the playing field, yeah. as you said, you know, you don't have to take as much money. You don't have to give your money to some company somewhere yeah. in Texas that might be dictating what you're you know, curriculum is or something like that. And that's well said too, and I didn't, never even thought of that as leveling the playing field because some districts might be able to afford those textbooks and all that stuff, but others mm -hmm. might not. So then it can level the students, no matter where, would be able to get, get the opportunity to look at bad text and make it better. I just did the same thing. I, I gave my students, I, I had ChatGPT create a movie review that was really bad because we were doing evaluative writing in my composition class. And then I gave it to them and they read it and they all, they all inst I gave it a, a fake, fake author, fake everything, made it look legit and then gave it to them and they read it and they were like, this is terrible. <laughs> and again, I had wiped the sweat off my brow and said, thank you. Thank God you all didn't think it was amazing. Right? And it was bad. So they were, they were actually able to notice that. But the other side of that is too, in 10 years, it's going to be better. Yes. And another 10 years after that, it's going to be even better. I mean, yes. this isn't going to get worse. No, the, it's the, only going to The GPT better. will get better at mm -hmm. what it's doing. Yeah. The GPT is the generative predictive text, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another thing, too, with how do we should embrace it in some ways. Because no matter what, when our students enter into the workforce in the future, this is going to be, they're going to be involved with it in some way. Like, this is going to be involved in their job in some mm -hmm. capacity. I don't know about where you all teach, but here we use Microsoft as our suite for everything. And it's already integrated into Outlook. Like you start typing sentences in your email, it starts finishing them for you already. 
Like that's already something that's integrated into the Microsoft Office suite at this stage. So I can only imagine it being further integrated into the more and more in the future. Google's is doing the same now as well. Maybe not. Google will tell you what you're looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe not on a document, but like emails and stuff like that, it's already doing It's, it's doing that predictive text for you as well. Yeah. So I think allowing our students to see the capabilities and exposing them to it is, I think shielding them from it is a disservice at this point. The shielding them from the, it is an absolute disservice at this point, right? Um, I know I've found it, and it's in, I've seen it in my classrooms this semester. I've had a number of students turn in drafts that looked well beyond their capabilities in some ways and I was able to sit down with them and discuss what was going on and I had two students actually straight up admit to me that they used AI to write their drafts. They got zeros on the drafts but then they rewrote their finals and were able to get actually some points on their final draft when they were submitted the final version but that's how I've seen it this semester. I know I've played around with some of the tools too, the, the tech detection tools. Anybody played around with any of those yet? They're really hit or miss um, and it's it's a shame, because like, there's real no real way to actually be able to find it unless you feel confident in your own ability to pick it out and be able to see it. Because those tools, I fed in some, I fed in a, a portion of my dissertation which I wrote, and it claimed it was GPT generated in some way. Um, so that I, I've experienced that. Yeah. I just attended a presentation from a professor at EPJ, which you might have heard about in the paper. I cannot remember his name right now, but he's a guru on AI and you know keeping up with it and as a professor he spoke to how the detectors you can't rely on them they're 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 detecting poor writing and claiming that that's AI produced then but many of our students are still poor writers and yeah. so it's not fair in that way and also a Pitt Maine professor I attended a conference there for work and it was on the AI and he's in charge of like the ethics and okay. consequences of students plagiarizing and whatnot. And he said they don't even consider the results of an AI detector because it's so unreliable. Yeah. So I thought I was on to something when I learned there were AI detectors out there and I was like, yes, this is going to help like a um, turn it in, mm -hmm. you know, detect and, mm -hmm. and every all the experts, or the two experts that I talked to, say don't trust it. Yeah. Although, interestingly, an anecdotal experience was I had two students, and one, when I said the AI detector claimed you plagiarized this, and she admitted it. Mm -hmm. So it helped, because then she sat and wrote her own version. But the other student looked befuddled, because she probably didn't. And I said the AI detector. So it was again 50 50 in my own little experiment yeah. that one did one didn't yeah i still find that the students who are going to want to cheat on writing are basically just they think they're clever and they go like to the 10th yeah. page of a of a google mm -hmm. um search you know i'm so deep into this he'll never think i, I and just copy and paste you know yeah and google will find stuff easily doing that yeah i mean just copy and paste the document the, the well, they thing. usually don't change the font. Either. Yeah, they don't. Well, yeah. that, as, soon as, <laughs> that font, yeah. as soon as you see that font change in the paper, you're like, mm, that yep. light gray. Did you the light gray in the background. Yep. I'm glad somewhere. we all have that experience. Oh, we've yeah. all seen those. We've all seen those. Well, at least if you're going to copy basic, if you like make the font the same, you're going to be good at it. <laughs> well, that's, I think you're speaking to something there too, because the ones that are going to use this aren't going to take the time to write a good prompt either. Like you're going to get pretty bad well, results. Well, that was the thing. Like, yeah. When I was telling you before, if, if, if you're going to give an example. Um, if you just type in my question, it doesn't even know how to write. I mean, the answer you're going to get is like all over mm -hmm. the place. Yeah. The more specifically you tell it what to write, you can get a much better essay. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. And I think a lot of our students they, they don't still know one. how to frame that question. Yes. So exactly. Are we better as teachers to give them a more specific prompt or actually give them a less specific? A lot of the teachers I've talked to who are trying to handle this, like, they still want to get good writing out of their kids. They know that this, because uh, we had a big countywide conference up, up in Clearfield County. A lot of them are moving back towards doing more generalized types of, of prompts, but having a lot of the writing done in class with pencil and paper. Yeah, blue yeah. yeah. books are making a comeback. Yeah, a lot of ways. yeah. That's just, definitely what I do in a lot of my academic classes. Yeah. So that's, that's what a lot of people are doing to combat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another suggestion that was brought up on Tuesday was 
starting with a baseline writing sample from your students on paper and then in class or whatever. And that way you can have a Something friendly conversation like, when like, yeah, this is clearly different. Can you tell me about that? It's your own little AI detector. Right. Right? Yeah. You, can, you can go back and look at that and compare it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. That, that. That's actually a very good idea. Mm -hmm. To get that sample right at the beginning. So yeah, so I think there are many different ways we can combat or embrace this as we move forward. And I think it's got to be a little of both, right? It's a little bit of combating and embracing simultaneously. In well, like I said, too, I showed them essays that it generates. Yeah. I'm like, this is what it's going to do. Boom, boom, here's another one, here's mm -hmm. another one, here's another one, here's another one. And they're all like, oh, it writes the, they all sound exactly the same. I'm like, oh, yeah. and I'm going to see it. And if you do use this, you know, obviously I'm going to know what it's, and they're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I was going to go in and, oh, I don't think it's up here. I thought I had it up. No, I guess I don't have ChatGPT up. I thought I did. I'll log into it. That would take a while. Mm -hmm. Oh, my record back here. Yeah. I won't bring it up and we don't need to play with it here, but I was thinking it as an option here, but it sounds like we've already played with it a little bit on our own. And I would encourage you to do so too, right? actually go play with it, see what it produces. Um, there's one school of thought that says don't play with it because the more information you feed it, the better it's gonna get. There's billions of people on this planet. Yeah, yeah that are feeding it information more, constantly. Yeah, like, so, yeah. yeah. But I would say, I, I would suggest playing with it as much as possible. <laughs> Use it, see what it's capable of. Try to get try to get ahead of your students' understanding of it at least is it the best best piece of advice I've ever heard. Something that I just popped into my head when you said that too is it could be a way to show students how to scrutinize what they read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Because so often I fear that young people are scrolling and skimming and absorbing what they read yeah. as truth mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. someone said it. Mm -hmm. or refers to someone else who said it and it could be a way to help them realize that there's flawed communication that isn't stemming from fact-based information yeah. almost like it feels like a safer teaching tool because it's not a human that it's coming from so they're more willing to scrutinize yeah. I think you're absolutely right, right, that they'd be more willing to do that. Because I've found that students aren't willing to do that sometimes if it isn't, if it isn't mm -hmm. actual. Or especially if it, this was published somewhere, so they automatically think this must be good. Mm -hmm. right? This has to be good. Even if, no, no, it's a bad example. I want you to critique it. Right? They still automatically think it's good. So that's a good idea there, yeah, of allowing that freedom to critique it because it's not human. You're not going to hurt anybody's feelings right. by calling it bad. Also, I've noticed, too, it's bad at critiquing. I don't know if you've noticed. It plays the nice guy. Like, if you ask it to, like, critique stuff, it's, well, some people might think yeah, that, like, it does a bad job of actually saying, no, this is a poor, this is bad. Like, it's it does diplomatic. It, yeah, it's yes. very diplomatic in that way. But that's because the people who are writing the program for it want it to be. Yes, absolutely. So, anything else on AI we want to talk about at this point? I feel like it's all I've been talking about for the past, <laughs> past about two years of, of my working here at this point, ever since it's popped up. Um, but I wanted to then start talking a little bit about the new composition curriculum at this point and go over the syllabus. I think you all got copies of it, or at least most people did. Mm -hmm. Got copies of this, the, either the comp, you have the comp two one there, I think. I do. 200. Is that, so some people, this might not apply if you don't teach the comp one, some may only teach the comp two studies in lit, or others viewing this later may, may only teach creative writing. Up, but we will look at the assessment. end up teaching the comp one. Yeah, so we will end up looking at the assessment years. standards for all the courses. But I wanted to make sure we talked about the comp one syllabus here. And I think we made an important update to the syllabus this summer. Like I said, bringing it into the 21st century. And I think some of the changes we made will also help with AI at this point too. And some of the things that we were trying to do too. Go ahead. So as we go through, I don't think not, none of the course description changed because that would have had to have gone through um, Senate and we would have had to, that would have taken a lot more time. But we ended up making changes to the course topics here. As you look down, right, we ended up removing um, two of the necessary essays for this one. I don't know if we recall, it had six. This, this, the previous syllabus for Comp 1 had six essays in it. 
which was frankly too much to get done in the amount of time that you had to be able to teach this course. So we've slimmed that down to four major essays that they have to produce now. And then there may be obviously other side assignments that you may give them in working towards these, right? But we've slimmed it down to a narrative essay, a persuasive argumentative essay, an evaluative essay, and a reflective essay is what we're requiring for composition one at this point. Um, we worked over the summer to try to parse out what four we thought would be the most productive for our students at this point, and we really fell on these four at this stage. And we are now teaching them in this order, but the order that you end up teaching them in is completely up to you at that point. But here, we felt like getting to the persuasive argumentative earlier was going to benefit our students because they're concurrently taking other classes that are requiring them to write research papers. And they're coming to me on week two and asking me about MLA formatting. And I'm like, we're going to get there on week 11. And I'm like, oh, God, maybe we need to get to it on week two now instead. Right? So we've moved that up as far as our curriculum here goes. And we're doing persuasive argumentative a little bit earlier. I don't think that's school. the syllabus yeah, we, not have. The one we have. That's not the one they No, because ours there. still has the five plus argumentation. OK, so they gave you the old one still. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very odd. I would think Cindy would have had the new well, one. This one's doesn't. not the total old one. No. Because I was looking at this one. This one's like a weird combo. What textbook? This one says it is. This one has the new textbook. Okay. Yeah, it does say fall 2023 on it. But it does not look but like that. But that is, yeah, the course topics are definitely different. Okay. They, they still have all of the other ones on here. So they still gave you sort of the hybrid one. Right, and that is an option too. So for this semester, they were offering that you could still teach the old syllabus as well. But as we move forward, it's going to all switch to the new one. As we move so I think, I don't know why they gave you that copy. So it's obviously some of us have already started teaching. Yeah, no, you're fine so if you've you already started stay teaching. Stay yes, you can stay the course. Stay the course, yes. okay. Yeah, then this was the last semester that we'll be staying that course, right? And then as we move forward, we're going to be only doing this one. And I know it's different for the high school classrooms too, because sometimes you teach them all year round, like all year mm -hmm. long. So if you're doing all year long, you can stick with the one you started with in the fall. Okay. Right? Obviously, you can stick with that one that you began with. But then to come next fall, you'll be switching to the new syllabus. And is fall. that posted on? Yeah. Is this the one that's posted online? On, on the ACE on, page? On the ACE page, it should be. Okay. Yes. I will double check that. Actually, thank you for email it out to us. Yeah. Thank you for letting me know that, because I thought they gave you the new copy. I will double check the base page for the new one. Thank you, Ben. You are coming on your syllabus and check the base page. Because we are still in sort of the process of transitioning to this new one, so that's why we were gonna, I was going to share it with you today, so that we wouldn't, that we next time when it does show up, it's not a surprise mm -hmm. that there's a new syllabus coming to you. Right? And, and ultimately, and um, Professor Harshberger here and myself have have really enjoyed doing this this semester. We are, we're sort of the we're, we're the test guinea, we're the guinea pigs. pigs. We're the guinea pigs. We're teaching this this semester already, um, and it's been going I think a lot more smoothly for our students, um, just simply because. Of, as I was saying, here at the college, they need to get that persuasive argumentative stuff a little bit earlier mm -hmm. so that it prepares them for their other classes. So again, thinking a little bit more about writing across the curriculum in that way and thinking about how we can help them in some of their other courses, um, we've really moved that persuasive argumentative up. And I spent, I will say, I probably spent too much time this semester on the persuasive argumentative, but I don't know if it was too much because the students needed it because mm -hmm. they really needed that much time to really work themselves through that essay. Um, and it was super beneficial for them in that way. Um, so we have the narrative, nothing new there, persuasive argumentative, evaluative, where we ask them to write a review of some kind. Right? I personally am doing movie reviews with my students because it felt more most equitable that they had access to, and we have movies available for free to our students in the library here, so they all had access to ones. But any sort of evaluative writing that you'd like them to do could be worthwhile in that stem. And then the reflective piece, and I'm saving this for the end, of our semester to have them reflect back on their writing and how they've improved over the semester to help hopefully combat some of the AI potential use there, that I can actually read their reflective pieces and see how they've moved forward in their own and grown and evolved in their own writing. Uh, then we also added this idea of reviewing and practicing the rhetorical situation, as well as composing first 21st century digital contexts at this point. So we want there to be some focus on multimodality in the new composition as we're moving into the 21st century. And we have an explanation of that down here. I will get to what we mean exactly by multimodality at this point. But then also discussing generative AI at this point is something that should come up in a composition classroom. We're sticking that in the syllabus here. Um, 
As we go down, these have not changed. You'll notice if once you do get the new version, you'll notice that the actual learning objectives have not changed. They've just been, we've just pared them down a little bit and made them a little bit more straightforward. Like they all now start with an actionable verb, um, compose, conduct, write, right? We actually gave them nice actionable um, statements, I believe they're much better written. We also removed a lot of the references to um, standard English grammar that were all throughout it. Um, while I know that's important, it's one thing that I think needs to be less focused on in, the, in this 21st century context. Right? You may have international students that are coming in. You may have students who are much more respective of dialects and those sort of things in this stage of life. So being letting people write in their own voice in some ways, we're thinking, is actually a good thing. Or is is at the college level uh, for academic uh, publishing and so forth, though, it's still pretty traditional, would you say? Yes, yeah. yeah, once you get up to the that level. But yeah, I mean, I don't know how many of our Composition One students are going to be right. publishing right. in academic exactly. in journals. So yeah, we, feel, we felt in discussing this over the summer, uh, we talked a lot about how Getting them to write is the important thing at this stage. Because if we keep pushing towards this has to be written correctly and it has to be written really formally, I think that's going to drive them to chatting and tea. It's going to drive some of those students to that. It's going to say, well, he wants it to look like this, so I guess I have to use this program to write it. And rather, I'd rather see it in your voice first. And then I can help you throughout then the process to get that maybe to a more standard formula, standard sort of voice at that point. But I think really harping on that pushes them to these cheating methods mm -hmm. in a lot of ways to really embracing the fact that they have their own voice and we're okay with that here, it's something we were searching for. Um, and then we have down here that the four major projects must cover the following genres, those were listed above. The persuasive argumentative essay must have a research component, so we're still keeping the research component in the class, obviously, as an important element. And as we look at the assessment stuff, we'll see here that we're looking at information literacy as one of the things we're looking at in composition this semester. Multimodal assignment must utilize at least two different modes of communication, right, is what we're looking for them to produce. Something that has photos and texts, audio and text, or some other combination in some way of getting them to a multimodal writing. Because if we look at the writing that's produced in the 21st century, very, very few of it is just words. Right? Most of the stuff is written for a digital context, and it includes pictures, videos, and everything else in, intertwined with those words in many ways. I've had my students do things as far as um, in my literature class, I had them, you are Ernest Hemingway, and now you have his top 10 Instagram posts. What, what photo would he have, and then how would he comment on them? What sort of comment would he have underneath his Instagram posts if you were Ernest Hemingway? What would, what would he say? Right? And I mean, those ones end up being pretty fun because I mean, Hemingway is pretty outlandish, um, and they have fun with that. Um, I've had students, in, they, they created a blog as if they were um, Virginia Woolf. I had students do that before, and they were writing from a room of their own. Right? And they were, they were doing a blog from the perspective of Virginia Woolf. So that also worked as a multimodal type of an assignment. And I'm going to, this semester, have my students do a reflective piece multimodal where they're going to have images accompanying their reflections. So they're going to, in some ways, have to do a little bit of image interpretation and say, so for paper one, pick an image that you think represents how you did on paper one and then write us a little reflection on it is how I'm going to have them work through that reflective assignment this semester. And again, guinea pig time, we'll see how it goes. And I can pass along that in the future and see how they actually do with that. But I'm trying to come up with ways to do that. But we really wanted to bring that multimodal aspect into composition because it's something that was lacking before and it's going to better prepare these students for the future. A quick share of an example that might be fun for some of your students. Maybe you do something like this already. But to help teach them rhetorical techniques as simple as repetition or um, illusion, and even if they want to get into the specific types of repetition, rhetorical question, whatever. Um, I've had students create advertisements, you know, maybe a billboard, maybe a something that they'd see online or whatever, and they would use the rhetoric with an image. Yeah, that's good. And then they'd have to talk about what type of rhetoric they used and to what effect or impact they thought it creates. That's good. Yeah. And they love it. Yeah. And I think that it's been more successful than just trying to teach them types of rhetoric and now write a paragraph using that rhetoric or analyze someone's rhetoric yeah. because it didn't feel like writing, mm -hmm. but it was. Yeah. And so I'm just sharing that as something that was successful. And then just to try to make it more 
authentic. Um, I'd ask them to pretend they were, I don't know, like an advertising salesperson and they're pitching their um, advertising campaign to a boardroom or to whomever and like they have to sell their idea or their theme and it just made it more interesting and I, it was uh, the multimodal idea. I, I do this with the, the English 200 students when we're reading poetry. Um, when we get to some lyric po poetry, Demon Lover and Barbara Allen and Evelyn Ray, I think is the other one. Uh, I tell them that I own, uh, I'm the proprietor of a YouTube channel that dramatizes poetry uh, using images and we have an unlimited budget. You can get, so you need to cast it with the actors that you think would have it. What would it look like? Uh, like what art mm -hmm. style would you use on it? Is this going to be acted out or is it going to be like, um, uh, is it going to be more like a slideshow, or is it going to be like animated? Uh, and then they have to pitch it to me, mm -hmm. uh, and with a few like they have to do like a, a PowerPoint type of thing with it, where they find some examples of images that would work with this. And then you know thematically, what part of the story, what what part of the poem do you want to focus on? Is it the love story? Is it the, you know whatever it might be? And so it's a very similar type mm -hmm. of thing where they have to you know generate ideas, but based on the text, and it's multimodal. So. Yeah. So this is why I love doing this. This is why I agreed to be the ACE liaison, was to learn from you all as well in a lot of ways. These are fantastic ideas of ways to incorporate yeah. those multimodal elements. In. I, now I would just change it. I think this year I won't be a YouTube person. I'll be a TikToker. Uh -huh. I mean, they're, they're making content for my TikTok. And we can hire whatever actors you want to play the demon and the woman in the poem. Or influencers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or influencers. influencers. Yeah. That's right. Oh. Pushing this. No, oh, I think oh, no. good. I think that's all of the major changes that occurred. We have the tentative outline down here, um, which gets into the new textbook, which I'm going to go into here next as well. But everything else is roughly the same at that point. It was mostly the reduction of assignments down to just the four major ones, um, and still including the research component, but then now also incorporating a multimodal component at this stage for Comp 1. Can I ask a question, even though I don't teach the 100, but yeah. you know, this uh, high school sometimes getting new textbooks, especially these very expensive college textbooks. Mm -hmm. You know, we sometimes are stuck with older ones yes. and or not even exactly the same textbook. Is that going to be a problem? No. You all can use whatever textbook you want for this still. For the, that's one of the things that still maintains through ACE that you all can use whatever textbook you want, but you're more than welcome to adapt to the new one that we have here. And I know that we have, I have on my next slide here the contact information for our one rep who said he's happy to work with high school um, teachers as well and he will also then get you in contact with Norton's high school area rep who will be able to help you with that also. So I know that that becomes a, an issue for high school uh, um, teachers and you might not be able to adapt the new textbook mm -hmm. but we are very excited about this new textbook and I think it is it has a copyright of 2023 is the main thing that really excites every time my students that look at it they're like wait what this was written this, wait it published this year I'm like yeah it actually, it actually was so and they get super excited about that because they're so used to looking at books that weren't published this year in a lot of ways so they get super excited about that but we've switched over to this everyone's an author textbook here here on campus and like I said, I do encourage others to adapt it whenever you can and whenever those opportunities may arise to be able to get that funding to get new textbooks. Um, Andrea Lunsford, anybody ever hear, heard? Does that name ring a bell for anybody? Maybe it's because I'm still in grad school. But she is pretty much the preeminent composition scholar in the world right now. Right? And so she's one of the most well-known. She's known for starting writing centers um, as one of those sort of directors, and she does a lot of work within composition. And she wrote this, she's the main author of this book, and she takes an approach that everyone is an author, right? That this is similar to what I was discussing there before, where everyone has their own voice, that no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, you can be an author, right? That everyone is, you are already, even you don't have to just be, you are. Everyone is an author in their day-to-day -day life. It takes some new approaches to some of our common assignments, much better than that previous handbook that we had before. Anybody using the Hacker and Somers handbook? Nobody? Okay, probably for the best um, in that regard, because that was not a good textbook for this course. That's the 75 readings. It was just a little handbook like this. It was just said, like, what, I forget what it was called. It was just the handbook for writers, mm -hmm. is all it said on it. No. Yeah, the handbook for writers, like fourth and fifth edition were the past two I think we had. 
and it was not very very effective as far as I was concerned, especially because it was mostly laid out like a handbook. Mm -hmm. like it wasn't laid out where it actually had readings and examples and things for the students to be able to look at. It was laid out, you have a problem, find the area that gives you the problem. I will say that this one comes with an accompanying handbook that free that comes with it. Every student gets a copy of when they purchase the everyone's when they get everyone's an author, they would also get the handbook as well in that regard. And for us here, we have it incorporated digitally for all of our students. So they don't even have to but once they sign up for the course, they get the textbook. It's just added onto their fee for the course whenever they get here. Um, and again, that'll work differently for all of you at that point. But it comes with accompanying readings, accompanying resources. They give you lesson plans. They give you videos that you can use for these. Uh, there's a feature called Inquisitive that I think is a really uh, fantastic feature that Norton has that comes accompanying with this book that offers students some ways to practice some of these skills online. And it gets graded by, gets graded by AI in some ways, which is a funny way that they're incorporating AI back into the teaching side of this that would be able to be, help those students in some ways. But like I said, if you're, anyone's ever interested in this, I will also pass copies around that you can look at if you wish. We have, I have three copies over here. This one's mine, but it's not that written in. So if anybody wants to look at it, I have those available here. Um, and I wanted to give everyone just an option to be able to see those if you wish. I, again, I don't know why I have it. I know Patrick sent them out to all of our, he, so he, maybe. Was, he was going to reach out to some of our ACE liaisons and send copies out. Or yeah. some of our ACE teachers. Looking at it like, that's the yeah. Send one to me. Okay. So I w he told me to tell you all, if you'd like a copy, email him. He will get one to you. Right? You will get one free. You can look at one on your own. Decide if you want to adopt mm -hmm. it. If you fall in love with it, get your district to pay for it. So in just some way. email him and tell him I'd like it. Yeah, so you can email oh. pcampbell at wwnorton.com and just say that you were one of the ACE um, ACE instructors for Pennsylvania Highlands. I think I can get one even though I don't teach I think you there. absolutely could. Okay. Just because. Because we're also using it in our 205 research writing class as well. Um, so we're using that across Comp 1 and 205 research writing are the two courses that this book will be incorporated in. And the students, and for us, it's great here at the community college because they pay for it once and they get it for two classes. So mm -hmm. they only have to buy one book and they can oh, get two yeah. courses with the one, one book price. Um, so it is a way for us to help save them some money um, at the community college. That's something we're always striving for here. But it is a it's a great textbook. If you look through it, I fell in love with it. Then it, I I had to bite my tongue. They took us out to lunch. Norton did, and then we, we looked at it. We were looking over. And I, I'm falling in love with this. I have to. No, we're not sold yet. You know, you have to put, do the staunch face at the table with the rep, with the salesman and tell them that you don't want to buy it. But it was it's a great textbook and one that I am really embracing as I'm moving forward in my teaching here. And I think will be useful moving forward. Um, yeah, so that's the new comp textbook. I don't have much else, to, and I'm also running out of time here too. We need to be done by seven. So assessment, right? Um, I believe, again, many of you probably already understand this, right? Assessment is different from grading, right? Assessment looks um, one or more of the course outcomes directly from the master syllabus, right? And each year you receive an observation site visit, you will participate in assessment. Right, so not everyone will be participating in this this year, but every year you do receive an observation site visit, you will participate in it. And I just wanted to go over some of the things we're doing in it this year. Um, we will always assess English 110 every semester, so anytime that you get observed and you're teaching 110, it gets observed, it gets assessed always. Um, and then we do 200, 205, and 215 for those, if anybody teaches creative writing, which I know Rusty does up where you're at. Um, we do those in the spring. It's one of the only ones that he is the only one that we have, the only ace creative writing instructor we have. Yeah. Um, I think you're wrong because I have creative writing. Do you? I do. Oh, that's awesome. It's my first year for it. Okay. okay. <laughs> I no. didn't even know that that was an ace option. He likes it. It, it is. I yeah. just started it this year. I'm looking forward to seeing what you have talked about there. <laughs> Actually, a lot of our kids at Kerwinsville take the 110 and 200 and in their sophomore junior year and then he, he offers it as well and they're like yeah i don't want to take english 12 and go backwards i'll just take this anyway and they're like mm -hmm. you know you probably don't need it for your gen ed they're like yeah it's okay yeah. it could count as a humanities like, yeah. elective or something for them yeah. down the line they, they, can, take they can put it in as that no matter what mm -hmm. um yeah and so i have our different assessments here that we're doing at this time so i'll go ahead and just look at these real quick if i'm running out of time English 110. Um, this semester we are 
assessing effective communication through a quiz that we have developed, and I will show you that quiz here as well. Back to this thing. Let's hide this thing. Oh, no, no, you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. So this is all a little bit different than before. Yes, it's going to be different than before. We've changed it from the way that Janine used to do it in the past. This one's so to assess for English 110, you will receive whenever it comes your time. You'll receive one of these documents here that has a. Cover page that's intended just for the instructor's eyes only because it has an answer key in it, and then a quiz that goes along with that, right? And this one's about information literacy here in particular. I can show you a little bit about what's on it. Um, and we've developed a 10 question quiz here that you can just give them at any point. I'm just going to give it to my students as sort of a final in my class this semester just to see how they do on it is the ultimate goal, just to see what they come up with. But you don't have to use it as a grade in your courses, obviously. It's just to send the numbers back to us. We want to see here at the college level how students are faring on these different things here. Right, and this one works. This one is the information literacy one. Um, and again, I'll send you all of these so you can look at these and have these to um, look at on your own. But as you see here, right, one indication that a source may be biased is that it uses language that is designed to elicit a strong emotional response or that suggests a strong slant towards its topic. Strong emotional language is one tactic used in titles that we are likely to consider clickbait. Um, which of the following article titles includes language that is designed to elicit a strong emotional response and suggest that your source may be biased, right? And you can pick all that apply. So we've got this common artificial so a disaster for your metabolic health. That one. Ghost sniper has ISIS running like little girls. Also, click baby. Right? Unemployment rates decrease in the U.S. That one's actually pretty straightforward, right? Explosive truth about police body cameras. Right? Another click baby title there. Right? So we're trying to get them to understand information literacy here through these quizzes here. And Lance and I worked um, over middle of October designing these quizzes. And then the effective communication one is this one here. Um, and it has similar things. This one deals with the rhetorical situation. So which one of the following statements best defines the meaning of the phrase thinking rhetorically? Um, Thinking rhetorically means thinking critically about the context that shape our choices as communicators. Well, A is the correct answer here for that one. There we go. Thinking rhetorically means thinking critically about political speeches. Thinking rhetorically means thinking only about your own opinion. Thinking rhetorically means thinking critically about a question that does not require an answer. Because that always happens when I ask my students, what is rhetoric? They're like, it's a question that doesn't have an answer. And I'm like, well, yeah, that is, that is one. That is, it's an effective way to do things. That's why that's called a rhetorical question. But we What's your thought on maybe a post, pre and post quiz? Using that. I think that'd be a good idea. Then we you can assess how they've grown in those areas too mm -hmm. and learned effective communication or information literacy throughout the course. You could copy and paste this into an AI and then ask it to write a new quiz for you based on the same questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk at all about how we could benefit from it. Yeah, I didn't talk about it, yeah. yeah. I use it to create rubrics now as well. Mm -hmm. I help, yeah, it helps me with my some of my rubrics and defining and re refining those and making them a little bit better. But I think another class on another on just how to use it for on our end, yeah. <laughs> we're already out of time here. I've utilized all the dates. So that's how we're assessing those in um, comp one this semester. Comp two, the um, class that you are teaching here, we are doing effective communication in that whenever it comes around. And for that one, we just are going to send those teaching that this section of a rubric, and you can obviously grade with your own rubric for a portion, but then we ask that you just use this to grade at least their, their communication in that section. Right? We're looking at 80% of students will achieve a level of four or five or higher on the paragraph development section of a rubric, That's what we're looking for in English 200 right now. And so we have this as the rubric scale for that, level one, two, three, four, five. And then you just send us those results back in that again. Those are the only ones that affect anyone in the room here. So what, these, what's, what is creative writing? Oh, yeah, you're in the creative writing now. It's a little bit different. So we had to try to get it into the, um, they're going to create a character for a work of realistic fiction. The student will consider that character's history, culture, and values to ensure they developed a well-rounded, realistic character based on lived human history and culture in some way. In some way is what we're looking for in that one. And so they're looking, again, for a level of four or five on this one here. And level five is that the character development displays deep and nuanced understanding of the three areas with multiple specific examples. Okay. 
Is this stuff on the ACE or no? This this is not, but I can get it's it up there. Okay. I didn't know there was, where, is there an ACE thing that you all have access, is it? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. They, they didn't let me know that. Yeah, it's only my second year being the ACE instructor, and so, or ACE, ACE liaison. on page for mm -hmm. us. But it has all different like, PowerPoints and okay. different assignments and rubrics. Yeah. So you probably want to, that's, that's your next. That is that's my next, next that is my next project, mm -hmm. is to get on there and. Like the Penn Highland page yeah. under the ACE. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm going to get in and. Make sure that gets updated to all of these new things. I'm Thank pretty you. sure Janine's name might yeah. still be on there. Yes, yeah. it probably is. is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and she retired, so hopefully I have access. I should have access to it. They'll be able to give me access to it. She and I maybe. Can you do it? Yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm related to McDivitts. She spells her name McDevitt, basically, uh, and but but he came from the same. So it, yeah. it's probably just an alteration of the same family. Mm -hmm. She was surprised by that. Yeah, <laughs> Janine did great work here while she was here, and I appreciate all that she all that she left me for a lot of this as well. So but, yeah, you may always have to update that. Yeah, so we're moving forward mm -hmm. in a lot of this. Um, summary: We've already gone all over this. Um, any questions for me at this point? I know I've used up your hour of time here. Do you mind if I stick around for a couple extra minutes and talk about this in two hundred? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank, you. thank you all so much thank you. for coming Thanks. this year. I hope you got to enjoy your time here on campus and I wish you all the best moving forward with all of this. And I look forward to meeting, the, coming and visiting the rest of you in, in, in due time here. Clarissa's got a while to wait again because I was, I, was, I was already over in Winber last, well, last spring. I was over in Winber. You were, you were. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good one. Is there anything new for the 200 besides? I, I probably need you to send that. Yes, I'll me. send you that. Yeah, um, the assessment stuff. For that sure. I need to know. Um, I'm still using the writers' uh, literature and its writers' textbook, okay. the sixth edition. Uh, but um, I did order the new Seagull one. Okay. However, they didn't get it for me yet, so okay. I got to check and see where that's coming from. So I'm still using the old textbook, which is a very traditional textbook. It's a lot of old dead white men yes. in there. And I assume that this is a lot more multicultural. Yeah, we moved into some more multicultural. I don't know which version this you have here as well. I have the okay. Seagull. Yeah. It's the Seagull literature book. And then, That's the most updated yeah, one. Yeah, and then, um, like, I have, I have, you know, I, I have substituted some of the old stuff that was on the old syllabus mm -hmm. with some other things. Like, for example, Silco was not on the old one, but it's now on the new one, but I already have that in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, as an example. Um, but yeah, so uh, is there anything I need to know besides like that assessment um, piece? No, other than, it sounds like you're already working towards the sort of the goals that we're striving for is to make it a little more multicultural and, and more diverse as far as its representation. But I'm also, uh, you, you've caught, that me, I don't mind the teaching of some of the old dead white guys either, right? There needs, no, to, be a, there needs to be a baseline there, right? Yeah, right. Reading, old, reading old texts and history matters, yeah. right? So giving them that is also not a bad thing. So I, do, I tend to do a nice mix. I don't follow that exactly. Like okay. I teach it. I don't even do Shakespeare. I, I do um, a Raisin in the Sun for my drama. I actually do. Um, uh, I do three or four of the short uh, one act plays that are in there. Okay. And then, because we have longer, we have more time than you. Yeah. I mean, I have my students probably three times longer you over do. the course of a year than you do. Yeah. So we do. Um, we also do Death of a Salesman. Okay. And then we do a Raisin in the Sun. Yeah. And then their their argumentative paper is based on those two. Okay. Uh, because it's interesting that they're written within 10 years of each other. They're both American families. Yeah. They're both in cities. One is a white family. One is a, a black family. Yeah. But the black family is more hopeful about America than the, than the white family yeah. is, which is weird. It is. For the time being. And our stu my students see that, of course, mm -hmm. as we're reading it. They're like, wow, this, this, this really, like, this ends on a high note. That one ends on such a bummer. Uh -huh. Why does this white family feel this way? But what right does this black family have to feel this way about America? Mm -hmm. And then they, they end up writing their argument in the papers. Okay. That. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. We do, from, I teach Raising the Sun, and then we watch the 2008 film adaptation starring Sean P. Diddy, yeah. uh, Sean Puffy Combs in it, and then yeah. I have them write an adaptation essay based on what okay. similarities and differences they see between the text versus yeah. the film. Alicia version. Rashad's in that. Too. Yes, she is, right. yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's always, I use, I love that one because they recognize P. Diddy. They're like, yeah. wait, isn't that? Isn't he a rapper? I'm like, yeah, he is. Like, yeah, I'm like, a decent actor too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I actually, with all of the texts, as many of them as I can find, 
I find them audiobook versions, and because I mean, if they're smart enough anyway, they're going to find the audiobooks. Mm -hmm. And.